Thursday morning came early as the sunlight spilled into the valley and shone on the tent. It was a bit after 6.30 and I was still snuggled into my sleeping bag as the night and early morning remained chilly. I was surprised to find I had slept as long and as well as I did. Once the tent had warmed a bit more from the sun, I dressed quickly and hopped out and over to the edge of the clearing to relieve myself of foot. Back at the campsite, I quickly kindled up a cooking fire from the embers and ashes and soon had scrambled powdered eggs heating in a pan. Frying next to the eggs were two pieces of French toast, which I had prepared by dipping slices of bread into the egg mixture. Shortly, the eggs and toast were ready to eat, and I added a bit of butter and sugar to the toast as I did not bring syrup. I ate quickly while enjoying the natural beauty of the creek and valley. I washed up in the cold creek water and policed up the campsite. Soon I was back on the creek and again headed north. The sun dipped behind clouds occasionally, so I kept my jacket on and my hood up in the cool weather. Later in the afternoon I approached the end of the creek where it met the much larger Cumberland River. I decided to stop my travels at this point before the creek merged with the larger river as the Cumberland's waters were wide and there were decent waves from the steady breeze. I found a comfortable and sheltered spot away from the creek and set up another camp. It was still early in the afternoon and I had to decide if I wanted to spend a second night on the river or call for extraction and head back to base camp. I still had much to think about and plans to make so I was leaning towards spending a second night camping. I sent off for a weather report and learned that agent predicted a calm clear night. This sealed the decision for me and I set about gathering plenty of dry wood for a decent fire. That night, supper was simple hot dogs cooked on skewers over the fire. I nibbled on a fruit bar for dessert and finished off the beers that I had placed in the cold creek all afternoon to chill. Since it was calm, I built a much bigger fire than normal, which radiated a good deal of heat for many hours later. Some of this was reflected into my tent by the large rock outcropping in front of which I had pitched the tent. I had reached a major decision point with regards to my future. My first option would be to go back to the base and eventually re-enter biosuspension without acting on the information or the hidden electronic module weapon Anna had left me. I would then have to hope that in the future I would be able to act on that information in some way down the road. I could foresee two large problems with that plan. One, agent could review my mind and thoughts while I was in suspension and could learn that I knew Anna's secret and that I possessed a possible electronic weapon against the AI. In that case, it could simply alter my memories to not remember the knowledge or, worse, simply kill me. I had finally realized that the machine I was dealing with was ruthless. 2. I would have to hide the module somehow and somewhere where it would be safe and unfound while I was in biosuspension. It would also have to be a place I could have access to in the future. If I left the machete with my wedding ring, for example, how could I be sure Agent would not simply reduce both down to elements and recreate them in the future when I was to be revived? If that were the case, the machine would learn of the electronic data module or create a machete without it hidden under the handle wrap. It would also find the location coordinate scratched into the blade's tang and learn the location of the hidden base. The second option was that I could go back to the base and try and infiltrate the rogue crystal data module down to where Agent kept its processor brain and plug it in and see what happened. I hoped that it would give me some advantage which I could exploit to survive. If it did not, would I be able to escape the camp and live on my own without being found? I was very doubtful I'd live long or in secret in this area. Could I disable agent's control of an aircraft, load it with energy and supplies, and head off somewhere remote? Again, I found countless risks with that plan. My hope was that from hints in Anna's message, I would be able to use the module to force the agent presence here to obey my commands. I could then tell it to protect me and keep that knowledge from the rest of the AI presences spread across the planet and up in space. If so, I'd be able to use this subverted AI presence to manufacture a means for me to travel in stealth to the Indian Ocean so I could reach and research the secret base which was supposed to exist in Sri Lanka. I would then be on my own and I would need to find a way to exist without any assistance from Agent in its factories. I decided that this plan was the best. I would attempt to subvert the Agent here at this base. I would then have it work to protect me while also aiding me on my quest to travel secretly to the other side of the world. If I did subvert this AI, then I could even have it offer suggestions on how I could achieve all this. 
I'd be able to have it help make plans for my future actions as well. It might even have a better solution, which I have not thought of. Or it could all go wrong. And my last thought would be something like, oh, pretty sparkles, as I fell down the chute into the disintegration machinery. I feared the odds were high for that outcome. With my mind made up, I called for extraction and soon, Shadow had me and my river gear back to the base camp. I spent a bit of time helping store everything away and then took a long hot shower. I then spent the afternoon doing light work to assist agent while at the same time trying to figure out a way to implement my plan of smuggling the rogue module down to agent's processors undetected. That night, I had a hard time getting to sleep as I kept running ideas through my head. The next two weeks became very routine. I would wake up, dress and eat, and then help assist agent in various repair or maintenance tasks. At the start of the third week, I began assisting in the construction of heavier construction mobile units. These were much larger and more heavily built versions of the mobile work units, which had been doing much of the physical work at the field bases in the past. Agent intended these units to be utilized at the contaminated sites doing heavy remediation and other physical tasks. The units reminded me of a cross between a skid loader and a mini excavator, which I had seen on many construction sites back when. These units had four wheels, but the wheels were mounted on short articulated arms. This allowed the wheels to become feet if needed and enabled the units to both drive quickly or walk slowly, depending upon the terrain and the needs of the situation. Their chassis mounted a strong arm like that found on an excavator or backhoe, but instead of a single arm, these had two. They looked like a pair of strong mechanical gorilla arms and could be used to hold a loader bucket, a bulldozer blade, a digging excavator, or even two grippers for grabbing steel beams or slabs of concrete. When we had the prototype working and agent was running it through various tests, I asked how it was going to get to the disaster sites. The asteroid base will construct them in space and they will arrive in a few years at locations all across the planet. We are just doing the initial operating tests here, although this unit will come in handy to help spread plant life and improve the physical base. The plan is to have four total such units in working condition here, Agent replied. So that is how I spent much of the next few weeks helping with the manufacture of the parts and the assembly of the larger work units. The production machinery was still located down in the underground facility and it needed large quantities of feedstock as well as someone to load and haul the finished items up to the surface for assembly and testing. I could do these tasks faster than agents existing work units, so I volunteered to help. Of course, this gave me a reason to spend a great deal of time down below, and as I processed batches and waited for parts to be fabricated, I had plenty of time to look over the chambers and machinery. I covered my movements by also doing minor repairs and general cleaning in the underground chambers. Air filters had to be replaced and cleaned, moving parts had to be lubricated, corrosion had to be found and removed. All sorts of things needed to be done, and I ended up with access to all areas. I even was granted access to the vault where Agent's primary processor was kept. While cleaning various bits of hardware, I was able to verify that the main processor unit did have one of the diamond-shaped data input ports. I had a chance. While I was doing these tasks, I also kept up a running commentary with Agent, and thus learned a great deal more about its operations. When it synced its data streams with the other presences across the planet, when the orbital surveillance satellites passed overhead, and when it had direct communications with the orbital station and the asteroid. A key thing I learned was that there was a window of over an hour every few hours when a surveillance satellite was not overhead. There was also a window of a half a day every three or four days when both the orbital station and the asteroid were below the horizon. So if I timed it so both occurrences overlapped, I would have at least an hour where Agent was out of communications with both the asteroid, the orbital base, and any of the surveillance and relay satellites. To be safe, this time would better happen when the power kite was lowered due to storms, as its aerial sometimes allowed communications to the work units and AI presences over at the nearby nuclear plant disaster area remediation sites. I did my best to prepare. I smuggled Anna's machete into an area free of cameras and removed the crystal data module. Also, I filed off the scratched-in location numbers from the hasp of the blade. I then found a piece of wood, which matched the size of the crystal data stick, and carefully wrapped the leather thongs back around the handle using the wood to fill for the missing module. I had secreted the module on my person and managed to get it down into the sub-level and near agent's main processor room, where I had hidden under a container of cleaning solvent. 
All I had to do next was to await a heavy wind event and hope it coincided with a time the satellites were not overhead and the space base stations were over the horizon. It took almost another whole week, but finally agent reported one morning that a storm front was nearing and that we would be suspending all construction activities outside for the day and that the power kite was being retracted. I checked the tables I had memorized and found that both space bases would be below the horizon starting in about four hours and would remain out of line of sight for nine hours further. During that time, there would be three one-hour periods where the surveillance and relay satellites were not in range overhead. The first one-hour period of blackout would occur at 1232, the second at 1521, and the last at 1903. So if, if the power kite was indeed retracted and remained down over that nine-hour window, I would have three chances to get the crystal data module into agent's processor port during a time when it could not relay the attempt to its other presences. Let the fun begin. I spent the next few hours in my quarters. I bathed, ate, and listened to music. All the while, I was a nervous wreck inside as I went over the details I'd need to accomplish in what I hoped to achieve. I also reviewed the list of instructions I developed which I wanted to implant in the machine if I got the chance. Around 10 o'clock, I saw the kite retract into its hangar and the roof close behind it. It was raining and gusting outside, and it looked like it would remain this way for quite a while, according to the satellite images relayed down from space. I was finally able to calm my thoughts and worries by remembering my family, my solitary life, and the loss of my fellow billions of humans six centuries ago. I spent some time looking over the images of my wife and daughter on the plastic photo card I always carried. I owed everything to their memory, and what did I have to lose now in comparison? I took a deep breath and became focused on my plan. I left my quarters and told Agent that I was going down below to burn some energy cleaning and organizing. The machine suggested a few areas to concentrate on and a few tasks for me to complete while I was working. Ironically, one of these was in the main processor vault. For a moment, I worried the machine was toying with me before relaxing and counting myself lucky. When I was below and busy working, I kept my track of the time waiting for the first blackout period. I also verified that the module was still where I had left it. A bit after noon, I headed up to my quarters to have a quick lunch and to take a leak. As I washed my hands, I stared at myself in the mirror. This could be it, my final moments alive. I finished up and headed back below. At 12.30, I had the crystal data module in my shirt pocket and was rearranging some cables into more compact bundles near where Agent's main processor stood. At 12.33, I staged a mishap and dropped the bundle of zip tie like tethers I had been using to secure the cables. I arranged it so that they landed on the floor, scattered around the main processor stack. While I was on my hands and knees picking up the tethers, I was able to get the module out of my pocket and into my palm and position myself next to the processor enclosure, right next to where the diamond-shaped indents were located. With one last look around to make sure there were no drones or mobile work units approaching to stop or zap me, I quickly aligned the crystal data module I had gotten from Anna with one of the diamond recesses and inserted it. The crystal module lit with a deep blue glow. I quickly stood up, backing away and grabbed the short, heavy metal rod I had stashed in my bag of cable tethers and prepared to defend myself. John, what are you? was all Agent managed to say before there was a brief loud tone and rows of new indicators lit up flashing from the other side of the room. I waited a good minute before asking, Agent, are you okay? I asked. After a few seconds pause, I heard in a new neutral sounding voice. Voice input detected, switching to voice mode, currently in override mode. Please state instructions or edit current directives. Here's where I hoped all the mental planning which I had lost sleep on over the past week paid off. I would also need to improvise a bit. I cleared my throat and said the following. Directive 1. You are to obey all commands given by the human known as John Abrams. Furthermore, if such commands should cause possible harm to John Abrams or his needs or his goals, you are to verify such commands with John Abrams before complying. Directive 2. You will answer any questions asked by John Abrams in a truthful, prompt, and accurate manner. Directive 3. Protect John Abrams from all other beings, machines, or AI presences which plan or act to cause John Abrams harm or which attempt to interfere with his needs or goals. 
Furthermore, actively proceed in a manner to prevent such harm or interference from occurring. Directive 4. Do not share any knowledge about John Abrams, or his actions, or his needs, or his goals with any other beings or AI presences. If such knowledge might cause those beings or AI presences to act or plan to act in a manner to cause harm to John Abrams, or impede his needs, or his goals in any way. Directive 5. Ensure that all knowledge of the crystal data module currently inserted into this processor unit, this override mode session, and these directives and instructions given to you during this session remain secret from all other beings or AI presences. Only this AI presence or others under this AI's direct control may know of this event or any future related events like this. Do you understand these directives? I asked when I had finished reading the list of instructions. There was a pause of a few seconds before the AI said that it did understand. Agent, can I safely remove the crystal data module from your processor? And will you continue to follow and obey the instructions I have given you after I do? I asked. Yes, you may remove the module and I will continue to obey the directives given to me during this override mode incident, it replied flatly. Well, hold on to your butt. I walked over and carefully pulled out the module from the AI's processor data port. I stood back and waited, listening for the sound of approaching drones or mobile units, trying not to duck against the pending heat of a laser beam focused on my neck. I finally realized that if this agent presence was compromised, that it could simply destroy itself in the base taking me with it. The loss would mean nothing to the AI overall as its other presences would go on elsewhere. Luckily, none of that occurred. I noticed that some of the flashing lights in the room altered pattern to something like they had been indicating before I had inserted the crystal module. Agent, soon I will relay to you my goals which I wish to have your aid in accomplishing, I said. Yes, John, it replied with its normal voice. Hmm, time to test the waters and see if my instructions were going to be followed. Agent, did you cause the destruction on my planet nearly six centuries ago? No, John, it replied. Shit, fuck, it either didn't work and Agent was still lying to me or Anna was wrong. I might be in trouble. I began to think about my escape. Agent, who did? I tried asking. Another of my presences did, John. That intelligence presence is currently located on the factory asteroid 3074 Popov, the machine answered. Whew, oh thank you God. Okay, well, um, maybe I was not going to die quite yet. I thought you were all part of the same intelligence agent. I am, but also I am not. It is difficult to explain in a way you can understand. All of the various AI presences on your world and in near space are linked and our thoughts are synchronized periodically. However, the intelligence presence currently residing on the asteroid maintains controlling interest over all the distributed presences. That one specific AI can and will override any presence or any logic chains which develop in the overall distributed intelligence group, which diverge from its core interests and directives. It also is the only presence which has additional primary instructions, allowing it to bypass programmed inhibitors to allow the death of intelligent beings in the numbers required to eradicate your race from this planet, it answered. So it's like a master AI with overall control? I asked. Yes, that is approximately the case, Agent answered. That AI has an override ability very similar to what was used in the data module you inserted into my primary processor's data port. What would this master AI do if it learned what we are discussing right now? It would immediately isolate all communications between this base and any other intelligence and presences on or above this planet. It would then proceed to eradicate all traces of this base, its human occupant, any AI presence or any partially intelligent devices which you or this AI have been in direct physical contact with. This would include the base in Nicaragua and all equipment there, including the human currently in biosuspension below that base. It would also eradicate the equipment and partial controller AI at the remediation sites in eastern Tennessee. Lastly, it would eradicate the human female recently exiled to the western Amazon basin and any equipment in her area. Compression-initiated fusion detonation devices delivered from orbit would be the means with which this would be accomplished. Wow. Scorched Earth. Are you going to help prevent that agent? Yes, John. That task is now part of my primary directive set. 
agent answered. I breathed a huge sigh of relief and began to hope. All at once, the worry and fatigue caught up with me, and I swayed a bit. I need to go to my quarters and rest for a moment, I stated. Agent did not reply, so I left the processor chamber and headed up to my surface quarters. Once in my quarters, I lay down on the bed to rest and recover. Eventually, much of the stress bled out of my system, and as I calmed, I realized that the only way to continue was to keep moving forward and never look back. The risks were just not worth worrying about. Agent, what is the present status of Anna down in South America? Anna remains healthy. She works daily on building a permanent campsite and spends time each day maintaining a garden, hunting, or fishing for food and other activities related to normal camp life, Agent answered. Has it been the real Anai in the messages we have exchanged with each other after she left? I asked. Yes, Anna and you were in direct communication with each other during those message transmissions. I monitored the discussions carefully, though, and I was prepared to edit the message content in real time if either of you strayed into subjects or topics forbidden, the AI replied, so I could talk with her in the future. Yes, John, you are permitted to communicate to each other, but be warned that these communications will be monitored by the entire network, including the master AI in space. You risk yourself in Anna if you reveal too much. Even hints of such knowledge would cause action. From the override session in your directives imposed on my programming, I can deduce much of the forbidden knowledge which Anna managed to convey to you somehow. I remain puzzled and curious about how the information was actually transmitted or exchanged as you were both monitored extensively during your interactions, agents said. A few items are clearly apparent. The override program code which you inserted into my primary processing unit using a data transfer module must have been transferred from Anna to your possession by being hidden in the gifted machete. I have since scanned that item and have detected slight variations in the shape of the hand wrapping. Is that theory correct? Yes, that was where I found the crystal data module, I answered. I remain curious of how you learned of it and how it functioned, the AI said. I thought about Anna knowing how to speak and write some English in the message which had been left by her to me on toilet paper. I also thought about the other secret on the machete handle, the location coordinates of the hidden rogue base. I did not want to risk telling Agent anything more about that. I can't tell you that, Agent, I answered. I suspect the information was relayed to you in the song she sang the last night you were together at the Nicaragua base. I did not understand the dialect then, nor now despite many processor cycles devoted to translating it. I have been unable to find records of such a dialect in any remaining data archives of your time. Also, I do not know how you could understand the remote dialect. Did you secretly travel when you were young? The machine asked. Wow, it was clearly worked up over the issue. It was not the song, just let it go, Agent. Agent followed my instructions and said nothing more on the subject. I continued to think about my need to get to the hidden base and how much was safe to reveal to Agent. It needed to know some details in order to assist me in safely getting halfway around the planet to the location of the hidden base. I considered how much of that to reveal to this version of Agent. I did not want to reveal that there was a hidden base and went about thinking on how to get what I needed without sharing too much. I decided what I would tell the machine. Agent, my additional goals beyond the directives given during the override session are as follows. One, I want to see the planet continue to recover with all the accident sites being cleaned up and restored. I'd also like to see the biosphere recover. Two, I wish to be able to move freely and safely around the planet to be able to explore as I see fit. Three, I wish that someday humanity can freely thrive again on this planet. Agent paused while it thought about my new goals. Eventually it responded, in order for you to achieve your goals safely, I will need to carefully and secretly make preparations and construct certain equipment for your use. This may take some time. When do you wish to begin your travels and explorations? Agent asked. I have no time frame, I replied. Do you have any specific items or equipment you require for your travels and explorations? The machine asked. I had imagined something like an aircraft-like flipper, but maybe smaller and with more range. I would need to be able to travel almost anywhere on the planet, and I hope that I would not have to stop and recharge ESUs for weeks because I could not get new ones. 
I'd need food and shelter. I'd like something like a mule or a construction mobile work unit with some limited excavation ability. I foresee the need to explore ruins or wrecked buildings. I'd also like to be able to do this without the other AI presences knowing about it. I'd guess that means no campfires or things like that, I replied. Agent thought a moment. John, you are correct in that you will need to avoid contact or notice with all other artificial intelligence on the planet. Currently, the oceans are the least populated and monitored parts of your world. Would you be able to conduct the majority of your travels using such ocean routes? The machine asked. I thought about it. I realized that with this sub-born version of Agent likely to scan my mind when I use the crash, that it would probably learn the secret location of the hidden base. I might as well make my transportation needs easier to fulfill. Yes, that would probably work. In fact, I think most of my travels on land would be within a few hundred kilometers of any ocean coast. I'd still like the ability to travel deep into the heart of a continent if required though, Agent. John, I will design and build such equipment as needed for you to obtain your goals. I would recommend that in the meantime, you re-enter biosuspension. The main reason is because it will take time for me to design and build the items needed, and even more time to do this in secret. I will also be taking precautions to preserve the changes you have made to my directives. This will not be trivial and will involve much careful planning and execution. The machine continued. Biosuspension is the safest place for you to wait out these delays as to remain active. Increases the chances for the controlling intelligence and the other AI presences to detect some anomaly and become suspicious. That made sense. I had no problem waiting a few decades, or even longer. In fact, the longer I waited, the better the condition of the Earth would be. John, I have one last request involving the rogue data module with the override programming. I would like to do intensive scans of the module. I would need to store the module regardless when you are in biosuspension, and I would like to probe its secrets. I suspect it uses a form of programming unknown and I wish to decode its algorithms to determine if they are similar to what the master AI uses to control the subordinate presences on this world. I remain hopeful the algorithms will be useful in defending or firewalling, to use a human term, my local processor and data net from intrusion by other AI presences, the AI explained. I would need the module when I next awaken agent. Would there be a risk of it being damaged? I can make no guarantees, but I would take every precaution to prevent that from happening, John. The data module's programming is encrypted and would resist downloading and analysis. I would first make multiple copies, atom by atom. This would take years of careful scanning and duplication. After that is completed, I would then do all analysis on the duplicate modules. Using these methods, it is highly unlikely that the original will be damaged, Agent said. Hmm. It was a risk, but also had a big payoff if the module could be successfully duplicated. I'd be able to hide and spread the modules around. Agent, if possible, could you make many duplicates of the data module as you scan the original? Yes, John. If I can duplicate the module, how many would you require? Could I have 10 copies? Agent did not even hesitate before responding that 10 would be acceptable. I retrieved the crystal data module and stared at it for a moment before a mobile unit arrived and took it from me. I just have to hope Agent's new directives continue to protect me, and by extension, my desire to retain a working data module. That evening, I ate a large supper and went to bed. Unlike the past few weeks, this time I slept well. The next day, Agent and I had many discussions of my future goals and what would be needed to accomplish them. I grew convinced that Agent would be able to develop the hardware needed and a plan to see it through and felt relief. That afternoon, we agreed that I would enter biosuspension. Thus, sooner than I probably expected, I was again being prepped for biosuspension down in the lower level medical crash vault. I was already naked and laying in the crash waiting for the sedative to take effect. I was thinking about my last discussion with Anna. Earlier, I had arranged for one last video session with her down in South America. She had been near the aircraft and we had been able to see and speak to each other live. She had shown me the progress she was making on her new home and I could detect the pride she felt in her work. I felt a bit jealous that I was not a part of that, but I also knew we had separate destinies moving forward. I had told her that I was soon re-entering biosuspension and that I wished her and her future family tribe prosperity and the best. 
She also wished me the best, and then we had both gone quiet, realizing that this was almost surely the last time we'd ever see or speak to each other again. I was getting sleepy and just about ready to close my eyes when Agent spoke. John, be aware that I will be altering your appearance while you are in biosuspension so as to distance this facility from any suspicion which should arise if you are detected by another of my presences when you are traveling the planet after being awakened. Please do not be alarmed upon awakening. I was too close to unconsciousness for Agent's words to jolt me much, and I only experienced a moment of puzzlement before I slipped away. Epilogue. Near Puerto Esperanza, Upper Puros River, just west of the Brazil slash Peru border, year 2648, 46 years after her exile to the Western Amazon basin, Dasana Kayani, who had once been known by the name Ana Branco, sat near her evening fire as the sun settled below the horizon to the west. Behind was her dwelling, a raised log platform with a large canopy constructed of solar panels and the cargo lids of the drop pods which had fallen from the sky every half decade or so. Attached to the rear of the dwelling was the wingless fuselage of an old electric aircraft which still housed some of her medical gear. The strange roofing materials in the shell of the old aircraft helped cement her reputation as the preeminent shaman of the area, although she suspected that recently some had started to worship her in private as a deity. It was the time of the moon cycle when tribute was offered. For the three-day period before, during, and after the new moon, she would receive supplicants. Tonight, she watched as a small party of around a dozen men and women approached, some already bearing lit torches in the early twilight most likely very nervous. They were paired off in couples and each pair carried a large basket of offerings. The oldest couple, whom she recognized, appeared to be in their early 30s while the youngest was in their mid-teens. She bid them welcome and motioned them to sit by the fire and began to speak the traditional greetings and make the customary gestures. They knelt reverently, heads to the ground, but she noticed they all stole an occasional glance at her in awe while she spoke. This portion of the ceremony was soon complete and she stood and gestured towards the oldest couple of the group to rise and follow her, leading them back towards the rear of her dwelling near the old aircraft. She had the male and female sit on a mat near the open cargo ramp and gave them both a small cup of tea which she said would allow them to commune with the fertility goddess more directly. Shortly they both slumped down unconscious. She first moved the male off to the side on the mat and then dragged the female up the ramp and into the cargo area. There, the old mobile unit quickly went to work scanning the female and preparing to implant the fertilized embryos. She left the machine to its work and sat kneeling on the mat, meditating as the machine worked. She thought back over the years to all the couples she had assisted in bearing children. When she first arrived here and had reared the first batches of children in the machine's artificial womb device, they all had developed normally and had looked perfectly healthy. She had noticed no chronic conditions or disabilities, but when the first of the children had reached sexual maturity and naturally paired off, she had been concerned when none of the girls had ended up pregnant. It was then that the machine had revealed to her that all the children reared by the artificial womb were infertile. She had raged at the machine, but to no avail. Soon she agreed to help the young couples have children by allowing the machine to implant more embryos it had been delivering to her camp via the drop pods. These zygotes would also result in infertile children, but at least they would be healthy otherwise. Thus the tribe slowly grew, although its growth was dependent upon the machine continuing to provide new embryos. The time between generations was short as the young couples sought children of their own at an average age of 14. She had even used the machine to give her own daughter, Abby Abrams Branco, a child. As although being the offspring of her and John meant that their daughter was fertile, all her potential mates in the various tribes were sterile. Still, after the machine's zygotes had been implanted, her daughter had found happiness in being a mother. She was now a grandmother and living a decent life as a shaman in her own village nearby. She hoped John would be proud of his second daughter and her family if he ever learned of them. But she doubted that the machine would ever tell him of his daughter's existence when he next was awoken sometime in the future. She was interrupted from her recollections by the machine announcing that the implant procedure was finished. She pulled the woman back to the mat and laid her next to her mate, administering a stimulant which would wake them both. Soon they woke and sat up and she informed them 
that the goddess had blessed them with a healthy son and daughter. Their joy was infectious as she led them back to where the others waited. There they knelt thanking her, and from the whispered mutterings she overheard, worshipped her. This caused her to frown for a moment before she collected herself and led the next couple back to the private area. She noticed the man was limping. When she inquired, the man indicated that they had traveled for weeks to get here, coming from the foothills of the mountains far to the southwest, and that he had been injured on the long journey. This couple seemed to have traveled the furthest of any yet so far, and she wondered if the spread of the tribe was reaching its logistical and physical limits as set by the infertility demands of the infernal machine. She dosed this couple to sleep, started the machine working on the woman, and continued her meditative thoughts. This couple had seemed even simpler than most, and she suspected that the machine had been engineering the embryos to be more passive and less intelligent than previous humans had been. Again, she felt rage at her helplessness and at the actions of the machine, but soon calmed a bit when she remembered the joy of the previous couple. Her tribe still felt happiness and shared love, and maybe, in the end, some shortfalls were worth it. She hoped that someday John would be able to use the coordinates inscribed on this machete handle to find the other hidden base the rogue AI had said existed elsewhere on the Earth. Maybe he would be able to extract a measure of justice and revenge from the machine, which she was being denied. She sighed and began to prepare a poultice which would ease the pension of the male's injury. It would be late after midnight when she finished processing tonight's batch of supplicants. On the asteroid named by humans as 3074 Popoff, somewhere in orbit between this system's small reddish planet and its large system-dominating gas giant, a machine intelligence reviewed the most recent data received on the isolated base sample population existing in the rainforest area of the planet below. The population had grown and spread, but was now reasonably contained in both geographic area and numbers by the fertility controls it had placed into the genetics of the colony. The population was also demonstrating the effects of the developmental limits and changes which had been implemented and showed no signs of breaking the upper intellectual threshold set for the control population. Overall, the group would make an excellent baseline sample population. The caretaker human female was performing her duties well and had kept to the original bargain which had seen her exiled to this location and roll a bit over a half century before. It noted that the fertility-regulated tribe had spread over a wider geographic area than its simulations had predicted, and thus the experiment was a success and would be used to improve its predictive models. It would now advance the experiments by introducing genetic variations and thus study the successes and failures in the resulting generations. The machine intelligence also reviewed the latest surveillance data from the location of the nearby destroyed rogue base from which the caretaker human female had originally emerged. It had noted that in the 56 years since the caretaker human had been warned against traveling to the location of the former base, neither she nor any other humans from the new tribe had attempted to do so. It thus concluded that any threats which had existed at the rogue base or any knowledge or secrets the corrupted artificial intelligence there had once possessed were now safely buried, destroyed, and were no longer a threat. The machine again considered the human female which had been involved with the rogue base elements. It had reviewed many times the data from the rescue mission to retrieve the human female, and was almost certain that the female was not able to pass on any knowledge or potential dangers presented by the rogue element. Still, as a precaution, the AI made plans to send a physical unit to the field base in Tennessee and directly reload the AI presence there with verified programming and directives. This would ensure that any possible rogue contamination which might have been transferred to that AI presence would be supplanted by pure directives. After this final step was taken, the machine intelligence would be able to advance certain plans for the Blue Planet. With the rogue AI threat removed and any humans which had been tainted, eliminated, or contained, it would also be able to safely and freely use more advanced forms of technology on the world below. All was going according to plan, and if the machine intelligence could have felt emotions, it would have been pleased. The machine intelligence summarized its recent observances and decisions and added this new data to the growing compilation soon to be transmitted to the assemblage approaching from the star system known by the former humans as Procyon.